Hello, welcome back. Uh, for more jobs to be done, uh, we started this morning uh, with uh, Jim Kalbeck and Scott Burleson, who, who kind of gave us the overview of what jobs to be done is. Now we are back. Uh, we have uh, Biat, Biat and Yan to share with us case studies right, on, on how they apply jobs to be done uh, using their customer-focused innovation approach. Um, so over to you, Yan, over to you, Biat, to share. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, good evening. Um, it's morning here. We're sitting in, uh, in, in Europe. And it's really a great pleasure to be um, in, this, uh, in this program. This is about uh, growth. This is about innovation with jobs to be done. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Jan. Hello? I, I, I did. You did? Okay, my, my, it's frozen. Digital, uh, this is about digital transformation. Digital transformation really has become a key driver for growth. Um, many leading companies are driving this. They're, dri they're, driving the, they're, they're, they're digitalizing the customer interface. Um, they can gain a lot of uh, growth behind this. And it's really um, a top priorities of CEOs. About 75% of CEOs today found in a BCG study say digital transformation is a top priority. COVID over the last two, three years really gave this a booster. Um, and, 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 but it was already a trend before. Adding to this, that we have a lot of new technologies coming out, artificial intelligence, blockchain, metaverse, um, um, but also a lot of uh, uh, material, biotech uh, innovation. It really has become, uh, innovation has become a hyper-dynamic environment. And in our experience, we really see organizations and teams in, uh, in an overdrive. We see that there are so many ideas, um, so many initiatives. And the question that we'd like to ask with customer-focused innovation is really how to deal with this. Jan, over to you. Yeah, so as Beard has mentioned, in our experience, the companies that we work with and the organizations that we work with, it, there is not a lack of ideas. The problem is not that they have too many, uh, too few ideas, I'm sorry, but rather that they have much, much, much too many ideas. So we experience most of the innovation organizations and teams that they're rather drowning in ideas and options, as Beard has mentioned them. So different technologies always come around. There is so much to do in digital. So companies are drowning in too many ideas. What we want to show you today is how Jobs to be Done can help you focus and not drown in too many ideas, but really from a customer point of view, from an outside-in perspective, know which ideas are much more likely to succeed in the market. And that is really what Jobs to be Done can bring and our customer-focused innovation process can bring a focus to the sea of ideas so you don't drown in them. This is where Ventbridge comes in usually, um, where we say we are about finding the winning ideas from the customer view, as I've mentioned before. We work in three different ways. So either we do in do doing turnkey projects that we deliver ourselves, or we coach teams to apply our CFI process. And then we do um, kind of smaller scale injection workshops where we just get, um, for example, get to know jobs to be done and get a first, first feel of it. We usually work for either the larger companies of this world or technology um, startups. So this is our client base. And today we're going to look at two cases from larger, larger clients. One was a turnkey project and the other one was uh, a coaching project. So back to you, Beat. How can Jobs to be done help us in this whole mess of too many ideas? Yeah, let's dive in. We have two principles, two things that we say help to prevent drowning on a high level. The first one is um, the relevant validation for the innovation ideas that you have with navigating power. So the, the new idea or the initiative has to really propose or promise a value to the market, to the customer. This sounds trivial, but um, we take this very much um, at, at heart. The value proposition has to be defined early on um, it has to evolve over time when the development takes place. 
And especially it has to be relevant. Relevant means uh, it has to solve a problem. Um, that is really relevant. A, a value proposition that does not resonate, um, that does not solve a problem is, is, is really fuzzy and useless. The second element that a value proposition has to have, it has to have navigating power. What do we mean by this? Navigating power, it has to inspire and guide the internal teams who are working in the development, management, developers, product managers, etc. But it also has to have the, it has to be compelling and navigating power for the uh, market, for the customers, because an innovation always has to change a behavior uh, in a certain sense. And therefore, the value proposition has to be compelling. So that's the, the number one um, principle that we apply. The second one is um, it has to be um, a fact-based view of the problem. Innovation um, typically has a lot of risks, can go wrong, and absorbs a lot of resources. That's why we say um, a fact-based view uh, with data-driven, researched, validated understanding of the um, customer problems or the pain points that customers have is absolutely critical. And the second one is this word concrete it has to be really concrete. Um, managers, executives typically are very strong in conceptual thinking um, to manage complexity, but customers, consumers, users are very concrete. Um, and that's why we say um, concrete unsolved problem uh, understanding is, is critical. And here, jobs to be done can help. Job, jobs to be done, if you go on the next slide, um, really, what is, what is, does it give you? It gives, first of all, an instant outside in perspective of the customer problem. The people don't want a drill, they want a hole in the wall. When this sentence is said, people instantly switch to the problem, to the challenge that has to be solved. They see the whole and all the problems that come with it to create this hole in the wall. Um, so that's, that's the first uh, uh, thing that jobs to be cut down can bring. The second thing jobs to be done is stable over time. We have afterwards some examples to, to, to show that. Why is it stable over time? Well, solutions, innovations, technology comes and goes, but the problem, the unmet needs of human beings stay. Um, so that's why uh, it is stable over time. And the third uh, strength of jobs to be done concept is that it gives a logic or a language um, to make innovation concrete. It's a language that can be used internally to talk about the customer problem and to focus on the customer problem. Um, and it also is useful for then uh, marketing and messaging to exploit and leverage these um, innovations. So back over to you, Jan, to illustrate how jobs to be done is stable over time. So we had mentioned it. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of uh, examples. So, I mean, what is jobs to be done really? It's, it's from our perspective, it's a name for a thought or for an idea or a logic or a way, a way to think if you want. And what it really is about is, is the following thought. If you really want to do customer-focused innovation, don't think about the technology or the solution first, but think about what do your customers want to achieve? What are their goals? What are their purposes that they want to get done? And only then, if you understand this purpose and the pain points when it comes to achieving that purpose, only then turn to the solution. Now, the beauty of this, which is shown here on the slide, is that jobs tend to be very, very stable over time, but solutions or solution ideas come and go. I mean, you can have many different ways of thinking about how can you achieve the job to send a message. And we gave in some examples. I don't know if it's really historically accurate, but you can see there are very different means, there are very different solutions and technologies that you can use to achieve the job to send a message. So from stone writing to really sending a person from somewhere to another place, bringing with him or her a message up to WhatsApp, Disc, uh, Discord, and all the other different tools or Slack that we have now to send a message. The job is always the same. So that is what people want to achieve, but the technology, of course, has changed. 
And the same thing is true for many, many different other areas uh, in our lives and especially in, in innovation. So in innovation, we say focus on the job first, try to understand what exactly is the job that your customers want to achieve and only then work backwards to the solution. Another example, just to show you um, one of these key benefits of being stable over time, if you look at, for example, the job to be entertained uh, or to play a game, there were very different ancient games. People, human beings um, are playful beings. They started very early on developing different games. And there is a series of technological development between there and today where we use AI or the VR goggles or what, whatever other tools that we have available to achieve the job to be entertained. So technology comes and goes, uh, solutions come and go, but the job, they stay stable over time. So this is something that can be really, really helpful not to drown in many different ideas because what you focus on, the job that you want to focus on, that one is stable over time, no matter how quickly the solution might develop. It's just the last example. I'm just going to show this, um, for example, to listen to music. Same thing. Technology comes and goes, changes over time. Now we use Spotify and all those streaming services. But the job to listen to music has been there for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. So that's one of the key advantages. You get really something stable to stand on in this whole quick, quickly changing uh, the te technology of today. Let me hand over back to you, Beat, and dive a little bit deeper into different cases. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have come to the conviction. Ventbridge works with jobs to be done logic since... Uh, more than 15 years. And over these 15, year, 15 years, um, when, uh, when we were pioneering jobs to be done um, in the years 2000, we really came to the conviction it works in every industry. Um, it even works in, in, in government. And we have now a project where it works, uh, where we apply it in politics. Um, and, and, and this conviction really comes from like to illustrate here. These are recent uh, examples, job to be done cases that Ventbridge has done in various industries. Now you can guess which product or which industry is uh, is behind it. Let's make an example. We have here the top top right to prepare a meal. That was a, a job that we were exploring and uh, developing innovative concepts. And there were three different companies from the three different industries behind it. One was um, a ready-made meal company, that was Nestle, um, a consumer goods company, um, you know, ready-made food is to prepare a meal. But behind there was also a pots and pan company. So kitchen cookware appliances, premium company, um, which is very strong in, 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 in Europe, um, very premium. That was also about prepare a, a meal. And the last one was a white goods company, like kitchen stoves and ovens and, uh, and, and steamers and microwaves, etc. It was also about preparing a meal. Um, so it really shows that it is solution agnostic and the, 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 the job stays the same. There were two uh, examples that we tried to pick out here, um, which is, is really to go from A to B. That was done for the Swiss railway uh, company, which uh, we will um, show you a bit more insights into it. And the last and the second one is to teach children, which was a U.S. company um, that develops uh, uh, hardware and software for teachers and schools um, for for classrooms. Um, um, and I had I hand over now to to Jan to introduce the case for uh, this. Uh, software company for teachers. So thank you, Beard. So we will start with the last case to teach children. And as Beard has mentioned it, it's about a, uh, a software that this company um, developed. So the, the setting is this one. They felt like there was an, uh, uh, an opportunity to develop a software that would support teachers in their daily lives, but also in planning their lessons and planning their month. And in a more or less customer focused way, so they did some kind of uh, interviews beforehand with customers, they developed a prototype of that software. And over the different rounds they did and iterations they did, 
from a, from a very specific small thing that they started with, it piled up ideas, 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 and different things were added onto the prototype when suddenly they were exactly in the position that we mentioned before. They had a hundred plus different feature ideas, different, very different things were in, in the software. So from planning your month to grading, to analysis of how the lesson went. So a variety of different things you have to imagine, and suddenly they weren't sure which of these things is actually something that teachers want. Which of these should we invest in? Because you have to imagine if you then go into development, that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of resources, a lot of money, and suddenly they lost confidence in, in, in which of these elements were actually the ones that, that, that would be helpful for teachers. And then in the end, Teachers, of course, would be willing to pay for. I mean, they want to sell this software and they kind of got lost. They got lost in the different options and the many different options that you can develop. That's when they approached us. That's when they came to us and said, hey, we have this prototype, we have this software developed, but where exactly should we put our bets? Which ex what exactly is the value proposition? They had some ideas um, and we'll go into this later on. For example, it is about saving time or we could help teachers save time, but it wasn't really clear and there was no conviction within the team to really go for one option. So that's when we went in and applied our CFI process, which is shown here in a, in a, in a coaching approach. So they were in Seattle, we were sitting in Zurich, but it was a remote uh, project where we trained the UX team on applying our project on this case. Like the question was, what's the value proposition for this new software? What you see here is the process that we apply. That's CFI, customer focused innovation. It always has these four steps, frame, discover, which are about the needs. There it's about understanding the job. And then two steps that are about solutions, spin and develop. I won't go into detail uh, too much here. We will go through the case along those steps. Uh, basically, frame is about kind of really framing, scoping the project from a job to be done perspective. Discovery is understanding the job and the pain points that, that people have. And spin and develop is making sure that you keep the focus and that you're actually developing things that pay into these pain points. For each of the steps, we have proprietary tools and unique tools developed over the past 15 years. Uh, I won't go into this now. You will see it at hand when we go into the case. But for each of these steps, we have different tools to apply and develop different tools together with our clients to, to, get, to get the process done in a very efficient way. And Beard now is going to show you the first one, the job hierarchy. So what does it, what does it mean to frame a project from the jobs to be done perspective? Uh, thank you, Jan. Start, starting with jobs to be done, um, it's quite easy. Very often there is a brainstorming and teams go into brainstorming and within 10 minutes, they have the whiteboard full of jobs that uh, the, the uh, customers or users try to achieve. Um, imagine you are a teacher, um, you are teaching uh, in elementary school, so small kids. Um, do a brainstorming, do a mental brainstorming now and immediately you will have uh, jobs uh, about why uh, is a teacher a teacher? What does a teacher want to achieve? For example, prepare children for life, um, but also ma make a living as a teacher, uh, etc. You, you have also jobs on a very lower level, like uh, preparing a lesson, like uh, firing up uh, some some computer slides, uh, uh, like like showing a video uh, on YouTube. Um, so very quickly, you have a lot of jobs and that's one, one, um, challenge really in jobs to be done to organize it, organize all these, uh, dozens or hundreds of jobs that you come up with, uh, so that it's, it's useful. And for this, we use what we call a job to be done hierarchy, which basically organizes all these jobs on the different levels. There is a higher level, which asks more about why, a higher why. There is a lower level, which goes much more towards a uh, journey thinking, customer journey thinking, which you have here to plan the week, to prepare a lesson, to deliver the lesson, to improve for the next time, but also to, to manage parents uh, who want to know about their kids or to exchange with colleagues. 
Um, and, and we use this hierarchy to, to organize, to scope, and to frame um, as a hypothesis before we go into exploration session. Um, so this for us is the starting point. Uh, and we really recommend to, uh, when you do a job to be done project, that you first put an order in a, in a pyramid or in a hierarchy like this before you go into uh, exploration, interviews, etc. It's almost like a guide for, for the interviewer, for the exploration session to know where to look for. Afterwards, there comes a second element, which we find absolutely critical. The job by itself is useful to give a perspective and a logic, but what is really key is what we call metrics. The power of jobs to be done comes with metrics. The metric is how do customers or users measure if a job goes well or not? Um, you can imagine if you go through a hierarchy like this, that you have dozens, if not hundreds of metrics, expectations that can go wrong, uh, things that people want to avoid, um, ex uh, things that take time, things that, that are not possible, um, things that are bugging people. So all these are very granular metrics that we, uh, that we draw out of the exploration. There are two examples of metrics here on this slide. For example, to refocus students as quickly as possible when their attention wanders or when there is an interruption in the class. This was a very specific matrix which was coming out frequently when we talk to teachers. Um, we have an interview technique to draw them out. Uh, we don't want to go into detail here, but we want to really convey the message that jobs to be done works uh, best when, we, when you look for these specific metrics, expectations that customers have or measure if a job goes well or not. Um, you have to imagine that we have in total 50 to 100 of these metrics explored, taken out of the interviews, and, uh, and then used for uh, the next step in the, uh, in the CFI, customer-focused innovation process, which Jan will show now. So basically what we have done now is we have done the step frame. We have done the first part of Discover, which is qualitative interviews, as Beat has explained. And now we kind of put on another level, which is the second part of Discover, which is quantitative validation. So what that means is we go out, we do a survey. Here it was 163, 163 teachers and ask them to rate each of these job metrics that we selected previously. How important is it to them? And they rate on a scale of one to five. And how fulfilled are they today? How satisfied are they today, today with these metrics. And what you get is what we call a value map that is shown here. So each of these dots that you see on the map is one of those uh, job metrics, is, is exactly this refocusing after an interruption has occurred, for example. Each of these dots is one of those. And of course, the, the metrics that are most, most interesting for innovation are the pain points, are the things that are very, very important on the right, but not yet fulfilled. So a very low fulfillment level. So that's the opportunity space to focus on. And just to give you a sense of what these were, we're going to look at three of those job metrics that came out of the study. So this is the real data. This is the real result of the study. For example, three of them, so in this group there on the lower right, you say they all had to do with, with the focus, with student focus, with student attention. And that was a big theme throughout the whole, the whole study, and we realized it's really about refocusing the students. How can we actually capture the focus? So this is what we meant in the very beginning with a fact base of unsolved problems. These three things are very, very important, but not yet solved for teachers. So the conclusion is, how can you position, of course, a software to address this? And Beat will talk a little bit more in detail about it. Yeah, it was a total eye opener for the team because uh, it, it basically transformed the view that they looked at their uh, solution, their prototype um, uh, before. Um, these three pain points or, and, and, and some more pain points, which were linked to um, attention, um, 
we're going into a process uh, in, in the spin phase that's now solution focused, and it led to a totally new value proposition. Before, they thought, well, this software probably helps to save time when the teacher plans a lesson. Um, there was the pain point that teachers spend too much time on a weekend to prepare the next week. The pain point was there, but it was not so really strong. The, the pain points about the tension were much more stronger and it, it totally changed the way they looked at the value proposition. We went through this process. We have some tools to sharpen the value proposition and to make the value proposition really resonating with the customers. And it's a creative process, uh, which is really guided by the results and guided by the, the tool. Um, and, it, and, and we came out up with a, a new value proposition, which we called one click, all eyes to the front. One click um, on the software and you get all the eyes of the, stu of the students, of the pupils in the room to the front. Um, this value proposition, one click, all eyes to the front, really has navigating power. It really tells in what direction this prototype should evolve. It really uh, tells developers what features they should uh, now um, accelerate and push. Um, it really resonates. It's relevant because it is directly linked to the pain points that we have identified before. Um, and um, it will be a success in the market. This company is now in the process of developing um, features that support this validation one click all eyes. Um, uh, they will go out into, into user testing to uh, iteratively to, uh, to, to, to qualify that, and then they will launch it in the market. And we are on the percent convinced that this solution will um, have a, a, a key impact in the market. So taking it back, value proposition with a navigating power directly linked to the pain points that we identified before, identified with the jobs to be done logic. Um, uh, this, this really is one a uh, key element to avoid the droning in too many ideas. Um, and would like to move on now to the next case from the Swiss Railway Company. Yeah. Perfect. So just to give you in the last couple of minutes, another glimpse in the second case um, for, for, from the Swiss Railway Company, a very similar uh, starting point. So they developed a digital travel companion. So it was an app uh, that basically could accompany you during your travels when you get from A to B. And uh, their problem was they had 400 plus I feature ideas and they didn't know how to arrange this on the roadmap. Like it's very, very different the ideas you can imagine. You can do a lot of different things um, if you do it like, like a digital twin for your travels from A to B. It was not only in trains, but also with cars or renting a car, renting a scooter and all the different things that were in there. So many, many, many different things, but how to focus, how can you find the 10 winning features? And we applied the same process that we showed before. So the, our CFI process, we started out with the hierarchy um, that is shown here. Just to give you a sense of the job to get from A to B, we don't have to go into details. We started out here, went into qualitative interviews, and then also quantified the metrics of the, that people have behind each of those steps. And we'll just give you a quick glimpse on what the results look like. We analyze it in a different way. So Beat will show it in, the, uh, in the, what we call the job journey navigator, where you can really see where the opportunities are along the whole journey, along these whole steps uh, there below where it says job journey. Yeah, what do we see here? Um, first of all, you see these little uh, numbers from one going to 69. These were the 69 uh, metrics that we have explored uh, before, that we have drawn out of interviews, and they were put into an order of the journey. The journey goes from to plan the trip, prepare, uh, stay informed while you are on the, on the road, go to the means of transport, Jan mentioned, can be a train, can be a bus, can be a bike. Uh, then to be on the way to travel, then to deal with interruptions, because also there, there are always interruptions in, um, in, uh, in travel. It can be delays, et cetera. 
to change and then to arrive at the final destination. So all the 69 metrics are put in an order, in a sequence. And then what you see is two curves. One is the importance curve, the blue one. How important are these metrics for you? Uh, and the second one is the fulfillment uh, uh, curve, the red one, which shows how satisfied are you today with your current solutions that you use uh, in this. And what you see here is, let's show an example. There is, for example, this uh, metric uh, to quickly know if you need to run to catch the train. So the situation is you go to the bus station or to the train station, and now you have to want to know, people want to know if they have to run or if they have to walk slowly. No? In other words, is, is, is the train about to leave or uh, do I have enough time to catch the train? And, and, and this, this is, came clearly out in the, in the exploration. This was put into this validation phase, into the quant phase, and you clearly uh, and it came out as a pain point. So people uh, were, were finding this, this metric really important, um, and they were not satisfied with this. And so you can see in this navigator where are the trouble spots. Um, if you go on the next slide, you see there are two areas where, where there's really uh, trouble. It's the moment you go to the means of transport, there are a lot of pain points, important unfulfilled needs, and then to deal with uh, interruptions, delays, etc., and change to change the change moment, change the mean of transport. So these are the trouble spots, and they were used as a as a going in for prioritizing the uh, feature ideas that they had, which Jan will show you now. Yeah. So now you have everything you need to sort through the 400 ideas. Um, you know from the fact-based level, what are the pain points? And what we did with the team then is what we call solution tindering. So probably all of you know Tinder. Um, it's kind of a date matching app where you can swipe right or left if you like that person or not. We developed the same thing for solution ideas. So what we would now want to know, of course, is which solution ideas that we have really address the pain points that customers have. So how do they match? And for this, we we, we developed an app where on the very bot uh, on top, sorry, you see those 400 different solution ideas. So it's asked for one specific solution idea. It shows one pain point. So one of these, I think 15 it was in the end, really, really strong uh, customer pain points. And each and every one can rate for themselves and is decide does the, 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 the solution idea that we have address, match, help to solve the pain point or not? So if you swipe on the left, that means the solution idea does not solve the pain point. If you swipe on the right, then that means it does address the pain point. And you can go quickly through those different ideas. You can also say, okay, a part of the team takes care of these 200 ideas, part of the team, the other part of the team takes care of these 200 ideas. And you quickly sort through each and every one on an app, uh, if, rather than being on Facebook and Twitter and whatever, you do a quick solution tindering. And then after a certain amount of time, a week or so, you get the results. And the results, I cannot show you the real, real results, but this is what comes out of it. So you will see which paints pain points are really addressed well with different feature ideas and which feature ideas address a lot of different pain points. So that's the other perspective. And then you can really go very precisely and say, okay, we have feature number two in this case, for example, that addresses a lot of different pain points and matched with many different pain points. So we should prioritize it. Or you have another case, for example, if you look at from top down uh, on the pain point two, nobody thought that that pain point has some feature idea that actually addresses it. So there you can do very targeted, very specific ideation because there is an unsolved problems that even in the list of 400, we don't have an idea for. And this way you can quickly filter out through the 400 ideas. This doesn't take a lot of time and you have a clear focus on, on the priorities. So that's the second part, a fact-based uh, uh, view on the pain points. And then you really find out what the hero features are. So this um, 
gave uh, an overview of uh, a snapshot into the customer focused innovation methodology. How do we, how do we apply jobs to be done? Um, it is really helpful not to drone in ideas. Um, it, 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 it is, it, it, jobs to be done really gives this perspective of outside into the customer problem. It is stable over time. It is solution agnostic. And it is a language that you can use internally um, to, um, to manage innovation and develop new, new ideas. Um, we offer this um, as turnkey projects, as Jan mentioned at the beginning, but we also offer it as a coaching. Um, our projects are, uh, so, sometimes they are quite small in terms of coaching when we work, for example, for startups or for, for, for smaller companies. And they can also be uh, quite pretty extensive if you work for multinational companies. Um, so get in touch with us if you want to know more about jobs to be done, if you want to know more how to apply it. We're very open and very accessible. Um, we always like to, to learn um, from different cases. That's, that's really the, the, you know, that, that is our inspiration when we hear some new challenges where jobs to be done could be applied. And then we, uh, we discuss and we do a lot of calls on, on this without even, um, thinking about the project. Um, I, how are we standing in time, Eugene? I think, uh, we are good. So actually we have some questions lined up, uh, maybe we just wait for, uh, yeah, we, we I'm good. Uh, I think we're good at time. We have some questions lined up, uh, but just, just a quick, uh, no, I can totally relate. I mean, I've been in the. Uh, in this uh, software, I mean, working with software teams, right, for, for about 15, more than 15 years. Uh, you're right. We, it's, there's no lack of features to build, right, at the end of it. <laughs> Everybody is like always about negotiating yeah. and then how do you negotiate, right? And then uh, yeah. the timing gets shorter. You, you, if you can't deliver in time, people get angry and frustrated. And then when you, when you drive out, uh, at the end, of the yeah. outcome is, uh, okay, the feature is there, but who's going to use it? Who is, who is using it? Does it really solve a pain exactly. point? That, I mean, I can totally relate to this. Uh, and that's why I think Jobs To Be Done was, you know, kind of like that secret sauce. You know, when I saw it, I was like, okay, there's, I mean, there's so many areas we can use to help to prioritize features, you know, how yeah. to, we know what to focus on. And I love your term, how yeah. you say uh, navigating. How do you navigate in internal teams? How do you bring people along? How do you uh, move, uh, bring the people along this journey, you know, to help them to achieve a good outcome, you know, for the project, for their customers, uh, and your slide on, yeah. you know, all the jobs that you have, you have helped, right? All the different case studies. That was so impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing, just a side note, I think we, we can, can you let us, I mean, if you have more information about that one click, all eyes front thing, right? Uh, I think we may need something yeah. here in Singapore, <laughs> right? To get our, <laughs> everybody to focus, you know, because we are we're kind of moving yeah. a lot into like uh, like uh, learning from home, uh, self paced lo lo studies and stuff. So so yeah. so I'll be interested to find out more. Uh, just yeah. just moving on to this next uh, last part, right? Is really some questions that that we have. So we put out some questions there, um, and we, we can get you to 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 you know uh, to reply to them. Can we have the first sure. question up? Yeah, can you see it? Uh, it's a teacher yep. software. How do you come up with the job matrix? Okay, can I jump in? Just for, so first of all, thank you so much, Eugene, for all that you've said before. Um, um, for the teacher case, so where also this question is 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 aiming towards, go to our website, uh, www.ventbridge.com. Uh, there is a section that we call knowledge and and there you will find different blog posts that we have and in on there is the case basically the case study of how we went through that uh, that software on our youtube channel you can also find an additional webinar where we talk with the client so the client talks through the process and and um, explains a little bit more gives a little bit more insight into into the case um Okay, so here for the questions for the teacher software, how do you come up with metrics? Um, that comes from teachers. So we do the hierarchy. You might remember the triangle as an inside out hypothesis. We do this in with the team. We, we have to discuss it a couple of times. And then we go out to teachers and do one on one, usually one on one. We also do groups, but we prefer one on one interviews, one hour interviews where we talk to a teacher 
and go through the different steps in the hierarchy and uncover the job metrics that they have in each of the steps. So they come from the teachers themselves. It's not that we write them, it's not that we invent them, but it's we have techniques and ways of asking the question to the teachers so that they tell us what are their job metrics. So it comes from qualitative interviews in this case. Thank you, Jan. Uh, maybe just to, 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 to build on that, right? Uh, you talk about interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, very similar to user research uh, in, yeah, yeah. in like design thinking and stuff. Uh, is, is there a difference or is, is there a more, is, how, how do you conduct this kind of interview? Maybe we can share a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, let, let me take this up. I mean, we use um, different methodologies like lettering. There is a special questioning uh, technique that we use. Um, what is the difference to, for example, design thinking? We say we have clearly defined what we look for. And sometimes we see in these user research interviews that it's not clearly defined what you look for. But we have defined that, and that these are these metrics, these expectation metrics, metrics that the users expect. They have a clear syntax. We have a, a questioning te technique to, to draw them out. Um, and uh, uh, and, 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 and I think that's, that's the, the biggest difference to design thinking. I would not say it's different. I would say it's really complementary. We work with design uh, thinking groups together, for example, the D school in, uh, in Berlin. And, um, and, and we really help, help them to make it more concrete and to really draw out metrics that are then often it's useful and actionable. So it's, it's complementing if you want. Great, thank you for that, Biat. Uh, yeah, can we have the next question, uh, please? Uh, yeah, how do you get the data for okay. importance and fulfillment? Is it a survey? How do you do? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, what we showed uh, before are two cases where we did a survey. But as we I mentioned before, we work with startups and and um, larger international organizations. So. Sometimes you cannot do a survey. And for example, with startups, we might do this on a hypothesis basis. So we build a hypothesis. But best, uh, best practice is, yes, we go out, we do a survey. We have a software ourselves uh, where we run the survey ourselves. Or we use, I mean, you know, the softwares like Qualtrics and so on. And there is a specific way on how to build the survey and how to ask the question. But in the end, yes, it's a survey. Uh, in, in both cases, if I'm not mistaken, it was an online survey um, where in the, in the teacher case, it was 160 teachers. And I think in the Swiss railway case, it was six or 700 Swiss, Swiss residents who, who filled out an online survey. Um, it has different elements. So we always say it has basically three elements. We have a screener part where we select the right people some profiling attitude questions, because it can very it can be very interesting then to analyze the data in, and look at different segments, different attitudinal behavioral segments that can really reveal very, very interesting differences then in the needs. And then of course, the battery of where, where they um, rate the different job metrics in terms of importance and, and fulfillment. So yes, it's, it's from, a, from a survey. All right, thank you. I, I think the, the next question is similar. So uh can we flash the next one yeah so i think you already touched on this uh the tools a bit uh can we can we go on to the next question thank you sorry i can't see the question so we have to read it to me uh yeah actually i i did okay then uh, i'll just uh the <laughs> question is how do you find the right level of job because you have the hierarchy yeah. Because I think mm -hmm. that's the important part, right? I think probably the quite the yeah. most important part just to be done is the scoping, right? So so when you when you work with your clients, uh, how do you know that you have reached the right level? Yeah. You know, and then that's where you then continue the rest. Can you share that, that more on that? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. That is absolutely crucial. And we spend a lot of time at the beginning because it's really about garbage in, garbage out. And uh, if you have the wrong hypothesis at the beginning, we, we, we don't get the, the, the right results. The way we do this is, um, first of all, we talk to um, spend a lot of time with the internal stakeholders, internal teams, 
can also be they're coming from the sales function, for example, or they're coming from uh, from uh, champions internally who know the market very well. But we know this could be biased. Therefore, it's a hypothesis. So we develop this with the team internally, and then we go outside and we validate it. We validate it with, con with uh, customers, users, consumers, um, and, and we have a saying internally uh, with us is uh, trust the process. The co customers will tell us immediately if we are right or wrong. Um, they say, they tell us uh, if, if we are on the right level, if you are too high up or if you are too low. They tell us if you use the wrong words and uh, they tell us if a step is missing. Um, and, and we really trust the process that the, uh, the customers uh, will tell us uh, right away at the beginning. I remember a project on diabetes um, and yeah. we said uh, that the, the focus job in the middle would be to lead a normal life. And we had an instant pushback from the diabetes patients. It was T1 diabetes. So they were born with, with diabetes and say, hey, how can you say that? Me, as a, as a diabetes uh, patient, I would never lead a normal life. Uh, what, what are you talking about? You, you, don't, you have no idea about diabetes if you talk like this. And we immediately changed uh, the approach. We went back to the drawing board. We explored with this, with this first two, three uh, uh, patients how it has to be. And then, and then we stabilized, we call that stabilized the, the, the hierarchy and it was right. So, um, it's an iterative process, first internally hypothesis, then validating and testing with users quickly. And then we go on. Yeah. Is that but coupled exactly. with your, your interviews or is it just a quick, quick, uh, you know, what do you think about this kind of can be quick test interview. With, uh, with people uh, that uh, are in this, uh, in this field, um, or it can be in the interviews first, in the, in the, in the first, first few interviews that we do. Right, I mean, right. Let, but, but maybe let's add something else to framing. Framing, framing is about this hierarchy, this, this job hierarchy on the, on the one hand. But framing is also about the business objective. Uh, the, we, we link uh, a, a, a job to be done project is not just done for the sake of the project. It always has a business intention behind it. Can be uh, in, uh, it can be growth, it can be winning market share, it can be defending against the competitors. Um, it can be about profitability, um, getting more premium or improving the margins. So we also spend uh, a lot of time in framing on, on the business goals. What's the, what's really the goal? And then we translate this goal into jobs to be done. So this translation, um, work is, is also key, um, because what you really want with our projects is have impact and the impact is creating useful, great innovation that will have an impact in the market. So that's the second element of framing. Yeah, ultimately, I think it's still about, you know, the survival of the company to do well so that they can continue to innovate. I think, I think that's an important point. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think we have yeah. time for one uh, last question uh, about product development. Uh, so, so have you, yeah. you talk yeah. about, a, lot, a lot of this is about the, the front stage discovery, right? I mean, have you, you know, move it downstream where you're, you're talking about uh, working with agile teams, software delivery teams, yeah. 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 So I can, I can elaborate a little bit. So there is what you would maybe say something like an ideal, but theoretical process where you would first start with the jobs to be done completely solution free and then go into the development for, and then use agile or other methods. Now, the reality is that usually that is not the case. Companies are in the middle of developing something. And then the question arises of where should we go? And, and, and that's okay. I mean, that's not, I don't mean this as a critique, but that's, that's, Usually the way um, um, companies function, they're working on an idea and then they're kind of getting, getting lost. So ideally we say, of course, as early as you can in the development process, try to include user needs as early as you can. It will speed up the whole development process. It will save you from iterations that add no value and that get nowhere. But it works really well in an agile environment. In the second project with the Swiss railway companies um, that, that we haven't mentioned here now, 
they were agile teams and they used our results in, in various different sprints to really and work really on very, very specific, um, even tiny features. So it was the question of how exactly should we write the push notification that the train is late? And that was a very, very specific project and only about how should information look like in case of disruption when, when you're traveling. And, and it was the basis for sprints where they actually focused uh, or much more focused, much more concrete, and it works very well in an agile environment. Ideally, you would do something like this very early on. The reality is that it happens very often somewhere in the middle of the development process, but the earlier, the better. And it does work in our experience really well with agile teams. So they can really, it helps them to focus their sprints and really work on customer focused data. I think it's great for like uh, backlog grooming, I think. I mean, if, you, if you're familiar yes. with, I mean, with agile, they like to, the product uh, uh, manager will yeah. come in. Okay, I need to groom the backlog. I guess this is where it really happens. This is where it really makes yeah. sense. Right. Uh, again, yeah. not killing the software developers with like one thousand features. I, I mean, you say four hundred to twenty to ten. Priority. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's that's great, right? That's great news. We can all do finish our work, create value for our customers, and go home and go home on time. <laughs> right. So so it's great work life <laughs> balance definitely. Uh, we just have one yeah. more. I think there's time for one more. Uh, we just flash the the question. Uh, yeah. I think I, I don't know. Just 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 a. Uh, there's one about features being <laughs> all, all, all important. How do you, maybe it's about stakeholder no. management, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, I, 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 yeah. What, what do you think? <laughs> Something. Yeah. It's a great question. What's the question? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. If in the <laughs> event all features are important to users, how do you effectively rank their priorities? Yeah. How do we rank the priorities? Well, we, <laughs> I guess yeah. have you even encountered the situation, right? Is it or is this really just hypothetical to you? Yeah. Can you answer? I didn't get the question. So the way the way I understand I mean the way I understand it in a certain sense, you could you could argue for all of the features are are kind of important, right? So uh, and then how do you make this translation from what well, well, maybe we find to really ranking features? So our logic here would be to say, don't try to rank features and don't ask, especially don't ask customers to try to rank the features because they will give very, very misleading answers. Customers are not that great at, on the solution level, on a feature level to say what is important to them. They will always be skeptical about very innovative things, but they say, I won't use feature X, but if you introduce it with the right value proposition and the right sales story, in the end, they will use it. So if you ask them on a solution level, you get very wrong priorities. It's, it could be, can be very misleading. So what we try to do is don't ask them about the features. Don't ask them about the different ideas that you have. Ask them about which problem is the biggest one. Which problem that you have when you try to get a job done is the one that is killing you and is really annoying. If you know this, you can link it to a certain feature. So we don't prioritize if you want. We don't prioritize directly the features. We prioritize problems, and that helps us to prioritize the features. So in a sense, not all of the features are important to users. What we try to say is, hey, if you have a thousand different ideas, yes, all of these thousand things add a little bit of value, but where is the market? Where really in the market is the big ticket idea that you should focus on and leave the rest aside? So that's that's what we do, and I hope this answers the question. Um, if, 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 I have, I can, if I have understood it correctly, <laughs> maybe I can add. Um, there is this, you know, from the pain points that we identify. The next step is then the requirements for the for the for the solution. So we 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 translate the pain points often into requirements, and then into technical specifications. So there is this. This step approach, and sometimes you can measure it. If the pain point is that it takes no time to do something, it, it much that it let's say time, and afterwards the requirement says, yeah, this solution has to all really minimize the time um, to to get something done, and then 
technical development, you can start to measure the time. But we know from the beginning it's about time, and, and, and then we can measure the technical solution about the time. And then very often, uh, in, in the next step, we can go into a, uh, into a concept test, which we call, we basically test the concept where we explain the features uh, on a feature level, but we link it to the promise, to the, to the, pro to the value proposition. And, and then we see the ratings of the concepts. And then we see suddenly the feature is really um, understood and appreciated because a feature brings a value. Can I add exactly. just quickly something? I think I, I understand, I now, I, I'm sorry, I probably have, now I understand the, the question. So theoretically what could happen is you have 400 ideas, you do a survey and it turns out all of the 400 ideas are equally great at addressing pain points. I think that's, that's the worry behind the, and then, so, okay. So one thing is it never happened before. It can, of course it can happen. It can happen that that, that is the case. But then if that would be, I mean, if you have a list of 10 and you still need to decide between those 10 and these 10 are really helping customers, of course, then you can introduce business criteria. How much resources do we need to develop this? Do we have the capabilities? What do we think is actually, are, are they going to be willing to pay for it? Can we capitalize it or not? So yes, at a certain point, you have to introduce maybe business criteria, which is absolutely fine. And you should do this at some point, but so usually if you have reduced it from 400 to 10, that's already a great, great reduction. If you have to select more, then of course, time to market, cost of development and different criteria then come which, but these are business criteria. So. Great. Uh, thank you. I, I think, uh, I, energy came to mind, right? It's like, if, if you ask people, okay, what features you want, uh, and you give them a buffet, they say, I want the buffet. Right, and they want yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a buffet, right? So I mean, it's it's, it's well, all of course. I, I'm gonna get 400 features. Why not, right? Uh, but yeah. I, I think you made a very good point that uh, we are not very sure on that. All right, what 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 solutions for But we are very clear exactly uh, what we need to get done, which is which is really tying back to jobs to be done. Uh, we know yeah. what we're trying to get. What's the outcomes? What uh, we are very clear as consumers or or human beings, we are very clear on what we're trying to get out of that, that particular yeah. solution or what, who, why we hire it, right? So we should yes. actually find that out first. You know, then leave the solutioning to the actual, to the, to the, to, to the people delivering the solution, right? And, and then use uh, concept testing to, to, to really say, okay, which one works before yes. we actually develop. So what a, what a great, uh, I think, uh, uh, last point, right? just to end, you know, coming back to human centricity, I uh, was this, you know, we kind of yeah. like started the day focusing on that, and now we're going to end the day uh, on human centricity as well. So, so wonderful. All right. Thank you again, uh, Biat. Uh, thank you, Jan, uh, for, for I mean, giving our time and sharing us. And, and, and uh, again, uh, uh, we go to vanbridge.com, right? I mean, you have case studies yes. there. Uh, you have, you have and and you connect through out, LinkedIn. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Eugene, have a, have thank you very much. And thanks to the NUS. So uh, thank you very much for having us.